Hi, everyone. Let's start the new year by being real, okay? Are you emotionally stressed? Or perhaps more accurately, are you emotionally distressed? Are you struggling emotionally? Do you feel emotionally like you're spiraling downward? Or like you're on a cliff and you think any moment you may free fall into the abyss? You're not alone. According to the American Psychological Association, in America, we are facing a national mental health crisis that could yield serious health and social consequences for years to come. An alarming proportion of American adults report that stress has a damaging impact on their day-to-day -day lives. Here are the stats. More than a quarter of adults, 27% to be exact, say that most days they are so stressed they can't function. And nearly half of those adults, 46% to be exact, are under age 35. Around a third of adults, 34% to be exact, report that stress is completely overwhelming for them most days. Cleveland Clinic reports that in America, one person dies by suicide every 11 minutes. About one in seven college students say that they've had suicidal ideation. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among people ages 10 to 34 in the United States. Please, please, if you or someone you know has reached the point of emotional despair, you feel like there's no hope, and you're considering suicide, call or text 988 to reach out to the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline or use the Lifeline online chat. They're available 24 hours a day, every day. Services are free and private. Again, that's 988. If you are suicidal or dealing with clinical depression and are in need of professional treatment, Please do not be ashamed about this and do not let embarrassment keep you from seeking the help you need. Make an appointment with a counselor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Take medication prescribed to you to care for your well-being just like you would take any other medication. Now most of us are not in the emotional space of pondering suicide but our lives are still experiencing significant stress. It, it may be good stress, like getting married or having a baby or getting a promotion at work or retiring, all of which are stressful in their own way. But there are other kinds of stress that negatively impact our emotional well-being, like the breakup of a relationship, marital problems or divorce, losing a job, sickness, the death of a loved one, physical assault, emotional abuse or bullying, significant problems in school or at work, financial challenges. As we start today a new series called How to Be a Healthier You, we're going to focus on how to improve your emotional well-being, whatever you may be facing in life. We're going to consider what the Christian faith has to say to offer you hope and help and healing so it might be possible for you to become a new you in the new year. You may be struggling with discouragement. You may feel defeated you may feel isolated and alone. You may feel anxious and upset. You may be having trouble coping with the stresses or pressures of life. What are you to do when you're at that place or in that space? What does the Christian faith prescribe when you need support, strengthening, help, because you're feeling emotionally overwhelmed 
or out of whack. One godly prescription to improve your emotional well-being is intentionally connect in authentic, caring community. You weren't meant to try and do life alone. God created you for community. The experience of genuine, affirming, supportive relationships is crucial to emotional health and well-being and is God's perfect will for your life. Throughout the Bible, we find again and again the counsel to embrace relationships that are helpful, empathetic, understanding. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Encourage one another and build one another up. Love each other deeply and earnestly. As this new year starts, how many of us desperately need to give and receive these one another's in order to counter all the negative, hurtful things that have been coming into our lives. Now, you may be thinking, okay, that sounds good, but how does that work in real life in the real world? You may want to experience meaningful relationships that are healthy and life-enhancing, but how do you go about it? One way is to intentionally seek out emotionally healthy and wise soul friends. Say that with me. Intentionally seek out emotionally healthy and wise soul friends. Okay, you said that, but will you do anything about it? Some of you may be tempted to think that you don't need any of this stuff. You think you can do life all on your own. You're self-sufficient. You have an I don't need anybody else mentality. You're doing just fine emotionally as far as you're concerned. You and God are doing okay, you think, and you don't really need anyone else's help. Well, if that's you, you're pretty impressive. Take a bow because you're more godly, more holy than Moses in the Old Testament. The Moses who was so close to God that God gave to him the Ten Commandments. The Moses who by God's power liberated God's people out of slavery in Egypt, crossing the Red Sea. You may be able to handle all the stresses that come your way in life without anyone else's help. But Moses couldn't, even though at first he thought he could. Moses had been leading God's people and had thought he could do it all by himself. They'd come to him with their problems and with their concerns, and he tried to help them out. But what happened is that he started to burn out emotionally. His stress level was getting off the charts. He was getting weary and worn down. Can any of you relate? A guy named Jethro counseled him that the way he was doing life was too much. It was unsustainable. Um, does that sound like any of us? Jethro said to Moses, You and the people who come to you will soon be worn out. The job is too much for one person. You can't do it alone. How many of us need to hear that? Moses couldn't do it all alone, and we can't do it all alone. We need one another to be emotionally healthy. We need soul friends like Jethro who will care enough about us to offer us wise counsel about how to live healthily. I have a Jethro-like soul friend in my life. I seek counsel from him when I'm confronted with challenges, when I need wisdom on how to deal with the stuff of life. This soul friend of mine provides counsel to business leaders and other leaders around the country. Once he was coaching a group of pretty high-powered leaders in Virginia on how to engage in self-care. 
and about the importance of surrounding themselves with a community of people to support them and encourage them. When a Q&A time came, one of the leaders challenged him. Okay, we hear you. We believe that's important. But who do you do that with? I was shocked to learn from the leader who asked the question that my soul friend said without hesitation, Michael Duvall. It was a valuable reminder to me of the importance of what I call reciprocal mentoring. Yes, we benefit from having a soul friend to support, counsel, encourage us. But we can do that for them as well. That's what the one another's of biblical community are supposed to be about. So I ask you, do you have at least one soul friend in your life who you are willing to seek counsel from? You can go to them with your issues and questions. You can talk with them about your doubts and fears. And you can benefit from their insight and wisdom. When I was considering asking Debbie to marry me, I was terrified. For generations, the vast majority of marriages in my family have ended in divorce. And I was almost certain that I was going to screw it up. And if Debbie agreed to marry me, I would mess it up and she would eventually leave me. I talked with my soul friend about my fears. He was honest and blunt in the counsel he gave me. He said, just because most of the marriages in your family end in divorce doesn't mean yours has to. You may screw it up, but it doesn't have to be that way. You get to choose. Just because your family has a history of breakups doesn't determine what will happen in your marriage. I needed to hear that. And this year, Debbie and I will celebrate 44 years of marriage. So I guess I haven't screwed up too badly. So, do you have a soul friend with whom you're willing to be open and vulnerable? You are willing to be honest enough to admit your weaknesses. Admit you don't have it all together. Admit you don't know all the answers. And you need help and support and encouragement because that's needed for true emotional well-being. And if you don't have at least one soul friend like this, ask yourself, why not? Is it pride? And understand that outward pride often is in reality a mask for an inward insecurity. Jethro said to Moses that he needed to surround himself with multiple people to support and help him. The wisdom in that counsel is that one person cannot meet all of our needs. We need a community of people around us to live the kind of life that God intends. That's why God gave us the church. Now, I know, I know. There are many people who say they don't need the church to be close to God. But that's not what God says. The church as the body of Christ is the community of faith, which is God's gift to us in which we practice the one another's that help us to grow in faith and to improve in emotional health. Now, some of you may be at the place where you think, I've done that. I don't need to do it again. I've done my time. Well, more than a year after Moses led God's people out of bondage in Egypt, they were still wandering around in the wilderness. After all that time, things began to unravel. After all that Moses had done for them, there was dissension and dissatisfaction. The people began to complain at him. They started to gripe at him because things weren't working out for them the way they wanted them to work out. Now, none of us would ever do that, right? 
None of us would ever expend our energy complaining and griping because things aren't working out the way we want. We'd never do that. But God's people, wandering in the wilderness, did. And Moses began to be worn down by the stress of it all. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servant so badly? And why haven't I found favor in your eyes? For you have placed the burden of all these people on me. I can't bear this people on my own. They're too heavy for me. If you're going to treat me like this, please kill me. If I found favor in your eyes, then don't let me endure this wretched situation. Moses complained to God that God was putting too much on him and that he couldn't bear it all. It was too much for him. He was emotionally as well as physically exhausted. How many of us do that with God? We say that God is burdening us, that God isn't treating us fairly, when the reality is that we are the ones choosing to put ourselves in situations that are more than we can bear. It's not God's fault. It's our choice as we try to take on all of life in our own strength and with wrong priorities to improve your emotional well-being. Intentionally acknowledge when you're taking too much on yourself because of misplaced priorities. God's intention is not to overwhelm us with emotional exhaustion. That's something we bring on ourselves by the priorities we set in our lives. Instead of blaming God and being angry with God, decide in advance to set healthy, God-honoring, emotional boundaries for yourself. Is it possible that some people will use these as an excuse for not engaging meaningfully in emotional connections and caring, productive actions? Yes. But many people need better life balance in setting priorities in their lives if they're going to improve their well-being. Now, you may know that Moses went up on a mountain and there God gave Moses two stone tablets on which God himself inscribed the Ten Commandments. But do you know what Moses found when he came down from the mountain. The people had turned their backs on God and had abandoned the way of life God required of them. They committed idolatry by fashioning a calf out of gold, bowing down to it, dancing around it, and worshiping it. When he saw this, Moses' anger burned hot. And he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Moses became so enraged that he shattered the tablets on which the Ten Commandments were engraved. And the misplaced priorities we have in our lives, the idols we worship in our lives, lead to brokenness in us, whether we realize it or not. In this new year, how will you handle the anger that comes into your life? How will you deal with your anger so that it does not result in brokenness in your life or in the lives of others? The issue is not, will you become angry? The issue is, what will you do with your anger? to improve your emotional well-being, intentionally choose to deal with your anger in a God-honoring way. There are times when we become angry and it's justified because wrong is clearly being done. There are times when we become angry 
simply because we are not selfishly getting our way. In any case, decide that you are going to deal with your anger in a healthy, God-honoring way. Do not let your anger control you. Decide that you are going to control your anger. Decide that you are not going to sin in your anger. The Apostle Paul writes, When you are angry, do not sin. And be sure to stop being angry before the end of the day. Do not give the devil a way to defeat you. Now you may be like, what? I can't do that. If you are a Christ follower, yes, you can. The Apostle Paul also writes, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have the capacity for self-control. And that is vital to emotional well-being in the angry, fractious, conflict-filled time in which we live. What do you need to do for this to become a reality in your life? Intentionally remember that God is always with you. God will strengthen, encourage, reassure you if you will trust in Him. If you will embrace by faith what the band sang in the original Journey Collaborative song that debuted today. Lord, you are my refuge. You are my fortress, ready to help in times of trouble. That's what the stressed out guy in the video found out. Now, I want you to notice something about all that we've talked about. Something that's needed to improve your emotional health. What's required? Did you catch it? Yep. Intentionality. Your emotional health will not improve one bit unless you intentionally take action to make it so. Will you? Well, will you? Let's pray together. God who loves us more than we can begin to comprehend. God who offers us the gift of grace, mercy, and caring. God who works by the power of the Holy Spirit to encourage us, guide us, and direct us. As we begin this new year, may we deeply desire to be the God-honoring, healthy persons that you are calling us to be. And Lord, we admit there are times we give in to complaining and griping and negativity. We admit that we tend to focus on ourselves and what we want. And when we do that, we build up these walls between ourselves and, and other people. Lord, may we begin the journey of opening ourselves up to you more and more, that you might change our hearts and our way of thinking and our priorities, that you may help us to be open to other people, to share our lives, to listen to them, to learn from them, and then we do the same for them. May we embrace the community of faith in such a way that together in this new year, every day we may become more and more like Jesus loving like Him, giving like Him, serving like Him. Thank you, God, for the gift of a new year. May we commit it wholly to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As this new year has begun, we are so very pleased that you were a part of this Journey Online worship experience. We invite you to be with us again online in the weeks to come, and if possible, to come to some of our in-person services at Northside High School. Today, I invite you to go to our website, journeyconnection.com, and to fill out the e-connect card there. Let us know 
in the beginning of this new year, how we might pray for you, how we might encourage you, we might be, how we might be of help to you. We really do want to be the love of Christ to one another in our community of faith. Also, as this new year begins, uh, we invite you to be a part of the ways that Journey blesses the lives of people and cares for people in our community. When you give financially to this church, yes, part of it blesses the youth and the children, people of all ages who come to our congregation, but you also help care for people in need in the community. And a portion of what you contribute goes to Feeding America to feed hungry people in our region. As this new year starts, would you make the resolution that you want to be a generous giving person this year? And you can give through our website under the giving tab as a way of showing that, yeah, you want to be a follower of Jesus. I pray God's blessings to be upon you as you begin this new year seeking to live a life that honors God and brings you joy and love and peace.